Over the past few lessons, we've been looking at the effects and the role of both the old and the new media, with some perspectives on each one. But now we're going to look at how the media is both owned and controlled, and how this impacts the kind of media that we receive, and the effect it has on us. Today, we're examining ownership and control of the media. Good morning slash afternoon. Purpose of this lesson then is all about ownership of the media. So it's slightly different to what we've done so far. It's less on the effects and more on how it's owned and controlled. Um, so think about the kinds of, of terms that we might have to use here. Think about how a media organisation is actually ran and how that can then impact the kind of output that it puts out. Um, you know, so every kind of media organisation is generally owned by some kind of wider corporation. That's um, the kind of basic outline of it. Um, at the kind of newspaper slash TV station line, there's normally an editor. This is the person who kind of makes sure that, that the output is kind of on a certain line or that it is towards a certain quality. So that's kind of like the basic terms. Um, so if I'm using the term... Um, conglomerate that's kind of referring to the company that owns it if I'm using the term editor that's kind of referring to the actual kind of person in the newsroom that's just kind of checking everyone's output basically um, so there's kind of two basic models of understanding ownership and control there's the pluralist model which broadly says that um, ownership doesn't really matter much um, and in, in many ways um, ownership is kind of a positive thing. The owners of media companies actually have a very trustworthy role in a healthy media. And on the other hand, you've got the Marxist view, which is kind of the complete opposite. That media owners dominate the news, they dominate the output of media companies in a very negative way. So we're going to kind of look at these two today. Um, but first, we're just going to examine some trends of media ownership, some kind of statistics and, and studies to bear in mind. First we have to examine a number of trends related to media ownership and control. There are a number of studies which suggest that actually the number of companies controlling the global mass media has significantly shrunk in recent years. Bagdikian, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, notes that in 1983, 50 corporations controlled the vast majority of all news media in the USA but by 2004, it was concentrated in only seven corporations. Similar trends can be found in Britain. Curran found in 2003 that ownership of British newspapers has always been relatively concentrated in the hands of a few powerful press barons. For example, in 1937, four men owned nearly one in every two national and local daily newspapers sold in Britain. Today, seven powerful individuals dominate the ownership of British National Daily and Sunday newspapers. Meanwhile, the content of commercial television is mainly controlled by one company, ITV, and the access to all of this television is also strongly concentrated in the hands of only two companies. News Corp, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch, that's how you gain access to Sky, and then of course you've got Virgin Media, owned by Richard Branson. A key term to understand here, and a major difference that we can find in media ownership and control compared with say 40 years ago, is the concept of global conglomerations. Global conglomerations are transnational corporations which own a number of media companies. And over the past 40 years, media has gradually been soaked up by these global conglomerations. They often have presence in many different countries and own media companies across those nations. There are two concepts which we need to understand in relation to how these large corporations manage their media products, and that is the concepts of horizontal and vertical integration. These are both essentially how they best manage their large media empire. Horizontal integration is when an corporation spreads across a number of different media products 
News Corp, for example, with Rupert Murdoch, owns newspapers, magazines, book publishers, and television channels, as well as some film studios in several countries. Now, that's one way of approaching it. It ensures a diverse range of media product. But then we have vertical integration, where they essentially centralize control over all aspects of a single media product. For example, film corporations sometimes not only make movies, but they will distribute them to their own cinema chain. So all aspects of the production of that media product is controlled by a single company. So those are more or less the facts of media ownership over time, roughly around the kind of last 50 years or so. We now have to look at perspectives on that. Um, one side, the pluralists, would argue that this is all kind of fairly harmless, that actually it's not really some kind of big capitalist conspiracy, it's more simply because um, economic necessity basically demands that we we do centralise a lot of our media ownership because it perhaps doesn't necessarily make sense for everyone to, to own separate media companies um, with the associated costs that that basically um, allows. It's far more um, profitable to own a lot and kind of share the costs around. Um, you know, it, it's a term in economics known as, as economies of scale. And the other perspective is far more negative. The negative uh, perspective obviously comes from the Marxist one, which is essentially that this ownership is a kind of capitalist conspiracy, that yes, it might be an economic necessity, but it does end up with a very negative um, and biased output of media. When we look at theories of media ownership, people will generally fall into two categories. The first category will see that media is shaped by consumer demand, so it shouldn't necessarily matter who is owning or controlling the media, because they will have to put out a range of different views and opinions in order to accommodate the consumer. On the other hand, we have the kind of more Marxist approach that would argue that if you have a centralization of ownership, then that will almost necessarily mean a decrease in the range of different opinions being put out and in actual fact it's likely to represent the interests of the kind of social group that can own media and control it. In the first category we have the pluralist theory of media ownership. Pluralists will argue that there is actually a great deal of consumer demand that influences the marketplace of the media. They will therefore only really give the buying, viewing public what they want to view, rather than what the journalist or the editor or the owner would like to see. Pluralists have a great deal of faith in media companies. They would argue that editors, journalists and broadcasters generally have a very strong sense of professional ethics, which acts as a system of control or a, a balance against any kind of potential owner abuse of the media. They would argue that it's very cynical to suggest that journalists would just surrender their principles and say or spout whatever the owner wants them to write or report on. Pluralists generally argue that the mass media is an essential part of our democratic process and getting us involved in the politics of our wider society, simply because today's public basically get most of their knowledge of the political process from the mass media, from newspapers or television. And they would argue, again quite positively, that owners, editors and journalists are trustworthy managers and protectors of this sacred process. For pluralists, therefore, it is not the owners that hold the real power over the media, but actually audiences. If they do not like what media owners are actually making available to them, they will simply not view that media. And if they viewed it as potentially biased or misleading, again, they would not purchase or view the media. So therefore, the owner does not have much power in deciding what people are going to consume and imbibe. If we take two examples of, say, the Daily Mail from a right-wing perspective and the Guardian from a left-wing perspective, these newspapers could not simply produce their product 
if there wasn't an audience ready to consume it. It would simply go out of business. The Daily Mail tailors its content in order to appeal to someone's opinion and perspective on the world, just as The Guardian does from a left-wing perspective. All of this means that the concentration of ownership by media corporations is not some kind of sinister motive or capitalist conspiracy, but actually the product of a rational economic decision. It's simply driven by the needs to keep costs low and to maximize profits. Globalization of media companies, again, is not driven by some sinister motive to spread some kind of cultural hegemony, but actually it's more of a need to find new audiences and to expand their exposure to the media. Pluralists argue that it's just practically impossible for owners to interfere with the content of their newspapers and television programs. Think about it, their businesses and conglomerations span national borders. How are they going to be interfering in every single one of their newsrooms? It just doesn't make sense. Not to mention that actually a good portion of our media market is actually taken up by public service broadcasters, media outlets which are actually controlled by the state, like the BBC. And the BBC has a legal obligation to basically inform, to educate, to make sure that it's pluralistic and diverse, and to actually make sure that it's impartial and objective. So this will balance out, in theory, any potential bias that you might have in the general media market. Not only that, but the ones which are privately owned are heavily regulated by state media regulators, like Ofcom, for example, the Office for Communications. These impose on media companies legal controls and rules to make sure that they are impartial and that they're not misleading. So the pluralist perspective is best evaluated from the Marxist point of view. In any essay or any kind of assessment that we do, um, it's always good to kind of bounce theories off each other. Really show off your understanding and your knowledge of both theories by comparing and contrasting them, showing where the areas of similarity are as well as the areas of difference. Um, so in terms of the pluralist view, Marxists would agree that a lot of this is purely economic. They um, disagree, however, that the audience is what sets that. They would argue that the capitalist class can basically sell whatever they want to the audience and the audience will accept it. Um, and all of this centralization of ownership into a few small companies, they would argue that yes, that's economic necessity, that's why they're doing it. Capitalism creates that kind of profit incentive. But then that kind of thing then allows those small number of owners to propagate ideology, to push forward um, their view of the world onto the working class. So they wouldn't see it as harmless. The strongest opposition to the pluralist view of control of the media comes from Marxism. And much of this we have already covered in our discussion of the Marxists' view of the role of media. They argue that actually the economic system of Britain and the class system that it produces actually grants more cultural power to the capitalist class because they are able to dominate institutions like the mass media and they use this then to transmit their ruling class ideology. Look back to previous lessons for more detail on how it creates false class consciousness this idea that the working class begin to accept capitalism as a natural and fair system. You can look back to the study from Miliband in 1973, who argued that the role of the media for capitalists is essentially to shape how we think about the world and to propagate ruling class ideology, simply because it is the ruling class that own the media. But another study comes from Tunstall and Palmer, they argued that actually the media and the ruling class that own the media are now essentially in control of the government. Governments are no longer interested in controlling the media because essentially they need the support and the power of media corporations in order to hold on to the electorate. This is a direct evaluation of the pluralist view that somehow governments regulate or control the kind of output that media corporations create.
simply because the media affects the electorate so much it's going to be very difficult for any government to actually challenge the media so they don't actually exercise much of this control. There are a few kind of noteworthy evaluations of the Marxist point of view. Marxists are often kind of saying that there is this grand conspiracy by media owners to propagate a capitalist ideology. It, this is very difficult to prove. You know, it, it's difficult to prove whether a newspaper is putting forward a particular opinion um, because of who owns it, um, rather than just simply the opinions of the journalists there in the newsroom. Um, it's mostly kind of based on anecdotal evidence from sociologists who are saying, um, well, look at Rupert Murdoch, he's right wing, and therefore all of his newspapers are going to be right wing. There's very little sociological evidence to suggest that he's actually there in the newsroom kind of governing what everyone's saying. Um, Meanwhile, we have to acknowledge a study from Curran, who argued that both sides, pluralists and Marxists, have kind of got this idea of ownership and control fairly wrong. He argues that pluralists are wrong in that media owners do influence the output of their media companies, um, but he disagrees with the Marxists about the motives for this. Um, there isn't this kind of grand conspiracy to all put out a pro-capitalist message because of ideology, because that's what they all subscribe to. He argues that they might mostly be towards the right economically, you know, free markets, um, deregulation, all that sort of stuff, but not for any ideological reason to maintain capitalism or to um, stop people revolting or keep the workers in a state of class consciousness or whatever it may be. He's arguing it's purely out of self-economic interest. That, you know, think about it from Rupert Murdoch's point of view. He simply thinks that right-wing economic policies are going to get him the most profit. Therefore, he is far more inclined to be sympathetic towards them. It's not that he wants to, you know, um, keep the working class brainwashed. That's too negative from Curran's point of view. Um... So that's kind of like wrapping up the the main two perspectives. Um, we will kind of add in a few kind of extra concepts next lesson on this, but broadly those are the two main models of ownership and control. Um, so just as before with, with the last lesson, go ahead and uh, have a go at those activities and that quiz for me.